let's get okay and let's get started so obviously our title today is um i'll have what she's having a further delve into the history behind the jewish deli so um you know most people from probably tell this is a you know this line is from mainstream culture it's from a very famous uh film called when harry met sally it came out in 1989 Right in the question, the famous scene is what was really, you know, so good? Was it the corned beef or the pastrami or something else? Um, so with that scene, right, uh, that film, if you've seen When Harry Met Sally, you definitely know that it is not about Jewish history. It's definitely not anything about to do with the Jewish people, but it's become like a quintessential iconic film. And right, very much part of New York City and almost, I think, and tell me in the chat if I'm wrong, if you can tell or you've watched this movie or know exactly uh, what I'm talking about. So, you know, when I was choosing a topic of something I wanted to do, I asked myself, well, why, you know, why would I want to do the Jewish deli? Uh, and I think that, the, you know, the Jewish deli has something, everything in it. It's something, you know, ingrained in Jewish culture, but it's also very much American it's, you know, this film especially is very iconic, uh, especially today, we'll see in a little video I'm going to show, it's become a, really a New York tourist destination, and right, Delhi has been all over the food, all over the world, um, and even myself coming from, like, an Ashkenazi family, I was like, well, I don't know, like, when my parents took me for, like, a New York deli that we had in Denver when I was, like, around 12, I was like, this is Jewish food? I, right, all I ate when I was growing up was like kalbaska. That was what my grandma would make me, uh, Dr. Sky kalbaska. <laughs> that was her favorite. Um, so yeah, there was like, when I moved to New York, it was definitely something very interesting, right? How, what, you know, how, where did this come from? And I think a lot of us, we live in these neighborhoods or we know these iconic mainstream places, um, but we don't always know, you know, where it comes from or where where the history is of something like, uh, the Jewish deli. Okay. So I just want to watch, I just want to show a short little clip of like something that has kind of been blowing up. Let me make sure my sound is shared. Can you hear it? Can people hear it? No. Yep. Okay. So this is what, you know, you can find it on TikTok or you can find it on Instagram, or you can find it on YouTube shorts. This has kind of been blowing up all over the internet. Uh, this is just a scene of someone asking, is the cat's deli sandwich worth it? So. Here. A Reuben sandwich with pastrami and a corned beef sandwich, please. Yeah. Perfect, man. Thank you. Here we go. We got the Reuben. We got the corned beef. Chills first. Reuben. Make a mess. Oh, oh go ahead. Ooh. Mm. You're making a mess. It's delicious. Here we go. We got corned beef, cheese, thick. Um, are they worth the $25? Yes. Worth $25 for a sandwich. Yeah. All right. Say so. Where are we? So, yeah, that is. Um, let me go back to. That is, you'll find that all over the internet, all over like. Um, TikTok. Uh, so the kind of the question is, I guess, uh, sorry, let's go. Why? You know, what is it in this sandwich? What has made this sandwich so iconic? Why has it made it a phenomenon? What does this say about, you know, Jewish identity, American identity, New York identity? Um, I mean, just look at it itself, right? It's 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 stuffed. It's overstuffed to the rim. Like it's it's something you know, tempting. It's carnival like. It's decadent in many ways. Right? It's like New York. You you want to take a bite of it. It's something that's going to keep developing and assimilating. And really, it's a big story of um, Jewish migration to New York City. And if anyone's been to Cat's Deli recently, it is no longer twenty five dollars. The sandwich is twenty seven forty five. Um. And they have a line out the door for this sandwich. So some guiding questions that I used myself uh, going into my research for and my own interest into the Jewish delicatessen is one, where does the Jewish delicatessen or the Jewish deli come from? Two, 
How did the Jewish delicatessen or deli become a part of American or American Jewish culture? Um, three, this is a, uh, did the Jewish deli help American Jews assimilate? Or did it rather help them keep parts of their culture? And for something that we're going to really see up to this date, what is, you know, the future of the American Jewish deli? So I just want to give credit to where credit is due. Uh, this is Ted Merwin. And he really wrote, I guess, like what is now the Bible of the history of the Jewish deli. He wrote Pastrami and Rye. An overstuffed history of the Jewish deli. It came out in 2015. Uh, this book won the National Jewish Book Award in Education and Jewish Identity. Um, Ted himself is an American Jew who grew up in New York City, and he really wrote this from his own love of, you know, when nostalgia uh, for the Jewish deli. Um, Ted has a PhD in theater and is a professor at Dickinson College. Uh, but also, I know him, I met him personally because he works as a senior writer at JFNA, the Jewish Federations of North America. So I got to work with him a little bit. And I kid you not, I had absolutely no idea that this man was obsessed and so interested with the Jewish deli until I started doing some research on the Jewish delicatessen. So, yeah, I would just say that if there are any questions at any point or something that really interests you further, I would highly recommend reading Ted's book. But, you know, before we can get to anything of where the Jewish delicatessen comes from, you know, the history of Jews in America, we need to really go back to meat itself and meat in Judaism. So if you are, you know, from the Jewish faith or you've been to a Jewish holiday, uh, or even been to a kosher store, you probably have an idea that, you know, meat is a, a big thing and in, in it's always been a big part of Judaism. Um, but really meat goes way back to ancient times and meat was part of temple offerings when we still had the first and second temple back in, you know, the temple periods, the Israelites. Um, and it was sacrificed by the high priests or the Kohens. So it was really rarely eaten and only for the privilege. And um, actually, before the Israelites entered Israel, if meat was not used for a sacrifice, it was considered unholy or unlawful. And there was a name for this. It was called a uh, korban. Um, so in the Second Temple period in, in ancient Israel, uh, you were much more likely to eat fish for Shabbat as meat was really, you know, likely occurrence. Um, when the Second Temple was destroyed in 70 CE by the Romans, Corbin and this whole uh, any kind of sacrifices in Judaism became forbidden as there was no longer a temple. Right. So that kind of ended the Jewish practice of offering meat. So instead, Jews started to offer their prayers. So going from that, how do we get to, you know, Romanian pastrami? Well, we go, you know, several future hundred years into history uh, to, you know, Europe, west to east. Jo Jews themselves started to learn and cure meat and sausage in the 10th, 11th century. Um, and again, just like the Jews are not special when it comes to preserving or brining meat. Most, you know, Western civilizations have figured out some other way to cure or preserve their meat. Um, but Jews start to bring it to Eastern Europe when they were invited to settle into Poland into the 18th and 19th centuries. And so they met these Jews from France who were kind of showing them their traditions. And then also in Eastern Europe, there were a lot of Ottoman and Turkish conquests who were coming up and conquering Eastern Europe. And they were fascinated by the way they were curing and brining their meat. So these Turkish conquests, this is, they used to air dry and store meat for up to a month by inserting it into the sides of their saddles, because they're all on horses, where their legs would press against uh, the meat as they rode, and the meat was tenderized by the animal's sweat. So, right, the more you learn, and pastrami comes from the word pastram, or pressed. Um, but even right in this period, Jews are very, very, very poor in Eastern uh, Europe and in Poland. They, you know, you're not eating meat on a daily basis if, if you are poor. Um, wealthier Jews in Eastern Europe did have corned beef as a part of their diet. Um, now, if you joined us uh, last month for Yigal's lecture on Jews and alcohol, uh, maybe you have an idea that, uh, you know, delicatessen was not really a thing in Eastern Europe, as especially they were much more likely to own pubs 
than any kind of delicatessen. Um, so why is that? Well, Jews in the Russian Empire and in Poland, they were barred from owning land. So if you don't own land, it's like truly impossible uh, really to have a lot of cows. So chicken and poultry was much more likely. Um, there was some evidence of some specialty grocery store in Eastern Europe, but Jews were more likely to have like a trade shop uh, where they could have a craft, where they could make leather or boots or shoes. Um, so most taverns in Poland were loaned to Jews by the nobility, and there were as many as 85% um, of taverns were leased to Jews by the, the nobility in Poland in the 19th century. And Jews did a great you know, favor for Poland because they processed labor for distilleries and they kept inns as it was extremely expensive to export grain due to tariffs. Um, so we're taking this like idea, right? This kind of tradition from the West to the East, from the Ottomans and Jews are gonna bring this ideas to America where they're gonna make a name for themselves with pastrami. Um, and they're also going to bring things all like bologna, tongue, brisket, brisket. But yes, it does come right from these Eastern Europe traditions and from brining. Okay, next slide. And right, what what is a delicatessen itself? When do they come to America? Now, delicatessen is uh, from the Latin word delicatus, um, so meaning dainty tender, charming, enticing, and alluring, and voluptuous. So, you know, think again of that big sandwich you saw uh, from Castelli in the beginning. Um, Romans also said that it meant sexual attractiveness. Um, now, again, it may be if you've been, this is kind of more likely, I guess, in like a Russian deli, you don't necessarily come to a deli or delicatessen to eat, right? You run in, you buy some specialty goods, and you come out. And um, in, the, in the United States, delis originally were kind of places for men because men would come before the rest of their family. So they really had more of a masculine feeling. But even way before that, um, the delicatessen and deli and gourmet eating comes from very bad um, upheaval, upheavals in history. So for, the, for one example, during the French Revolution, right, the first and the second estate, they got rid of it. So they got rid of a lot of clergy and nobility. So a lot of chefs were out of work. They needed jobs. So what did they do? They went out and they opened, right, it's very trendy now, they opened charcuterie shops because they needed, they needed jobs. That was what they were trained to do. And people who were not necessarily kings or bourgeoisie could come and, and try something new. I'm going to Italy. Pope Gregory the 13th in 1572 he kicked out all of his extra chefs um, because he believed his cardinals and bishops should not have such luxurious food so he uh, you know what did these chefs do again they didn't go and become farmers they opened salumeries and they again started to sell these gourmet foods and this kind of brought the delicatessen and this idea to Europe and right delicatessen comes from Central Europe uh, right, and that's, uh, they were opened all over Germany, and specifically in the late, late 19th century, there was a one delicatessen in Munich that started to bring goods from all over the world. Uh, right, we're starting to speak about a time of imperialism, globalism, trading. So in that uh, delicatessen in Munich, bananas were seen for the first time from the Canary Islands. So as more goods were brought from all over the world, the delicatessen is where they went and you know it was like a world of wonders and fruits you'd never seen and all kinds of gourmet eating so obviously we're going to give more of a story of jewish migration and the jews coming to america but it was the germans who really started the delicatessen in the united states right from our title right there, 1850, Klein Deutschland, right, Little Deutschland. So huge migration by the 1850s of Germans come to the Lower East Side. Uh, right, if you know a little bit about New York history, maybe you know that Germans created a big enclave and closer to the Upper East Side in Yorktown, but originally they were in the Lower East Side. So they were fleeing unemployment, famine, political and religious oppression, and there were so many Germans in the 1850s in the Lower East Side that it was the third largest 
uh, German population outside of Berlin and Vienna, just on the Lower East Side. So again, these people were living in tenements, they were poor, they were immigrants, and not all of them had jobs. So what did they do? They started to bring delicatessen from Central Europe into America, and it especially helped them with their homesickness, and they were especially popular uh, during Christmas. And the first actual recorded delicatessen or story about a delicatessen was published in the New York Tribune in 1875, actually about a dispute that happened in a delicatessen between a man and a, a woman and the you know the woman wanted to the man wanted to marry the woman and that's actually how delicatessen first came to be known or published about in New York City um so nearby if you know the lower east side there was Chinatown and again a huge migration of chinese immigrants were coming also to New York City the lower east side and right, they started wandering into Klein Deutschland and they start to see these delicatessens and they're fascinated and they say, well, why don't we also open our own? So they do, right? And again, they start hanging ducks and roasted pigs and all kinds of things, right? That entice people to come in and see what kind of different goods they have. And right, if you go to Chinatown, any kind of Chinatown to this day, this, this you know, you'll still see these hanging ducks or, or chickens and this spread to other kinds of immigrants as well. Same with the French, 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 excuse me, Spanish and other immigrants. There was tamales that were brought from Mexico, kangaroo meat brought from Australia, air dried beef from Spain, blood sausage from Italy. And again, Little Italy also opens nearby. And we have some more photos, right? So here is Chinatown on the left in 1903, right? All the interesting goods is hanging. This is your original delicatessen. And on the right, we have Little Italy, Little Italy in the 1900s. So again, all these huge populations of migrants are coming to the Lower East Side. And right, they want to bring their food. They're starting new lives. And they bring this idea of delicatessen to get people to come entice them and, and try new things from around the world. Some other things you could find in the Lower East Side in this period of the early 1900s. On the right here, you have a very uh, important place that was the candy shop. And if you're asking why is the candy shop so important, you can you can still actually go and find some of these historic iconic candy shops to this day in New York City. Um, one, it was very cheap, right? Almost anyone could go and afford like one or two piece of candy. But even if you see in this photo here, there's a lot of people speaking, right? That was a place to make friends, um, right? You could go and find a job there. You could be learning English. You could become American and then just, you know, see how many people are out in the streets looking for work, looking for friends, learning English, um, right? This very tiny tenements there, there are on the streets and we have on the top peddlers and, and again, people, you know, selling things from, from their homeland. Um, okay. So if you're asking me, okay, fine, but where, where are the Jews? We know, you know, if we know a little bit of uh, New York history, there's also a huge flock of Jewish migrants coming at this time. But there was very few Jewish delicatessens at all in New York City in the 1850s. So why is that? Most likely is that, you know, Jews like to cook their meat at home. And right there were more many kosher butchers. So around 1887, there is a claim that Sussman Volk uh, brings pastrami to the United States. He brings it, sorry, one second. Right, he opens his own delicatessen after bringing it. because he notices that a lot of housewives are having a hard time, you know, brining and making different kinds of meats in their tiny um, apartments, All right? So they open the first delicatessen with not just pastrami, but also other things that were cheap to eat. So frankfurters, dill pickles, cold cuts, and hot dogs. But there was something very special about this pastrami and this recipe that had come, you know, from Romania and Eastern Europe. There was paprika, hot pepper, um, and right, pastrami sounded similar to salami. So they also thought more people would come in and uh, be interested by that. Um, and so on the right, same as 
pastrami comes to the United States, we see Cat's Deli open in 1888. And really, in many ways, this is revolutionary because we can perceive these as the first kind of Jewish delicatessen. Um, Cat's Deli was not originally Cat's Deli. It was originally opened as Iceland delicatessen by two brothers who were from the Iceland family. Uh, Willie Katz arrived in 1903 and he got involved in the delicatessen business and it became Katz in Iceland. But by 1910, the Katz family brought it, bought it out from the Iceland family and it became Katz Deli. And that is a photo from very like late 1800s. So again, why are there, why is there not so many of these delicatessens? Let's go to this slide. Well, when immigrants, they don't really have money for takeout. There is also this idea that it's not healthy. It's easier to eat at home. Um, but overall, at this point, they already started to eat a lot better than they used to in Eastern Europe. And why is that? It's because there's finally this idea of like processed meat and the idea of huge slaughterhouses that open all over the Lower East Side providing kosher meat. Um, and there was also at this point kind of this idea that we can eat a lot more meat if the meat comes from a bull. Um, one specific example of this is Hebrew National, which you can find to this day, right? Anywhere, almost any supermarket, Jewish, non-Jewish, you'll find it. It began in 1905 by a Russian Jew by the name of Theodore Kranin. And right by 1928 they began manufacturing hot dogs and to this day right it's still around but it really started from these humble lower east side uh roots so by the 1900s as this is going on these slaughterhouses are opening there is a lot more kosher meat in the jewish diet to the point that even when there is a rise in prices of kosher meat women jewish women go out in the streets and protest in 1902 and they boycott it until the meat, the cost of kosher meat goes down. But overall, right, the, in this period, uh, these Jews are still very poor. And if they do eat meat, they try to save it for Shabbat. And uh, right, I just spoke about all the different spices you can find in pastrami. There was kind of a taboo for these immigrants that when they first came to America, they have to stop eating all spices and they have to stop eating garlic because Americans don't eat that. Americans eat bland things. And we need to, you know, acculturate and become part of the American diet. But around the same time, as you see in the photo on the right, the soda fountain becomes, you know, very popular. And this idea that, um, you know, soda can ail the stomach of any kind of food you eat. And uh, right again, it's kind of a cheap and easy thing you can go out and, and sit and drink. So slowly over time, there's kind of this, will we, will we don't go to the deli? But eventually it's kind of this idea that yes, we can wait a minute, we can eat our food, that is our heritage in a place in public. And, um, you know, they it was cold outside. So eventually they started putting chairs and these delicatessens bringing more and more people uh, from the outside. So as you can see, right, we have many more chairs and kind of a boom begins from the start of the 20th century. Uh, a lot more delicatessens start having chairs and people start to like it because right there, again, they want to go and they want to go meet people. They want to go eat their food of their home of their homelands. And right, it kind of becomes like a third place outside of their home and their synagogue. It's a secular place. And these delicatessens start opening all over the place, not just in the Lower East Side, but slowly to the Harlem, to the Bronx and Brooklyn. And right, they were acculturating into American society, but also holding something onto them. And there were certain things you could always expect at this Jew Jewish delicatessen, even in the early 1900s, you could find matzo ball soup, you could find salt brine pickles, not in a vinegar base. And right when I was doing my research, I was thinking to myself, okay, but something, you know, by the era of the Great Depression, things probably get worse. Absolutely incorrect. The era of like the Great Depression, the 1920s, the 1940s is by far the biggest boom of all delicatessens, and I'll tell you why. In the 1920s, New York City was 29% Jewish. That's like 1.6 million. There were 1.6 million Jews. And that racked up to, at, from 1920 to 1940, 6,500 kosher butchers, 
1,000 kosher slaughterhouses, 575 kosher meat restaurants, and 150 dairy restaurants. And if you throw in non-kosher delis, that, that was another 2,300. So they're everywhere and there's a lot of Jews coming and they're right, they're going to this place and they're making jobs, they're making, they're finding jobs, they're making friends and they're starting their own businesses, right? And then they're bringing in new families and new generations and, uh, you know, changing, changing who they were from Eastern Europe to America. And this is going to go into the next kind of piece of history, uh, especially Jewish immigrants like to go to the delicatessen to meet and eat before they go to have uh, to a show at Yiddish theater. Okay. Now I have to, of course, bring a very honorable mention because as many of you said, when I asked you what kind of sandwich you liked, many of you said bagel or bagel with locks. Well, you cannot find that in the origic, original historic deli. Why? Because deli is always something very meaty, a story about meat. And these Jews are not, you know, they're kosher. They're not uh, acculturated quite so much or assimilated quite so much, yet they're bringing very much kosher traditions. So, right, if you know anything about Eastern Europe or you've been to an Eastern European household or even any kind of store from Eastern Europe, you might be asking yourself, where is the fish? Where is the smoked fish? So, of course, alongside the delicatessen, you had the appetizing store right? Literally from the word appetizer, because you would eat fish and other dairy things as an appetizer. And this, yeah, this comes absolutely straight from Eastern Europe. In Yiddish, this is the forspas, if anyone can correct my Yiddish forspas, or the cold appetizer. So these also opened in the late 1880s, right next to the delicatessen. Uh, they were especially easy to eat in the tenements because, right, it's very simple to cut up and eat a smoked fish, even if you're in a tiny apartment. So as you may see, some honorable mentions um, that I wanted to talk about, even though this is a story of the delicatessen. We have Barney Greengas, which opened in Harlem in 1908 and moved to Amsterdam Avenue in 1929 in the Upper West Side and is still there. Um, Russ and Daughters, which is still in the Lower East Side, opened in 1914 by Joel Ross, who came to America and sold schmaltz in a barrel. That was his original job before he could finally open his store in the 1920s. And Ross never had any sons, so he had daughters. So he named her Russ and Daughters in 1935 to honor his daughters who started to join him in the business. And another one in the middle that is super famous and continues to this day is Zabar's, which originally did open as an appetizing store and opened in a little bit later in 1934. And just to give you an idea, there were over 30 of these appetizing restaurants just in the Lower East Side. And again, they came to other boroughs just like the Delicatessen. And what could you find there? Whitefish and lox cream cheese, and of course, smoked fish. So there you go. If you wanted to go and to the delicatessen and ask for a bagel with lox, they would look at you very strangely in the 1920s. You would say, they would say wrong place. And another very honorable mention is also the luncheonette. Um, anyone see anything interesting that's different from the delicatessen in the photos? No? Or have it in the comments. Only yes, women. yes. It looks yes, correct, correct. All women, right? When we looked right at the cat's deli, we saw men, and the luncheonette became a feminine place, right? All your employees were women, so right. This kind of grew out of soda counters. From the soda counter, they started adding seats, and specifically, women started to come in there and have a sandwich when they were shopping or going out. Um, so again, we kind of have delicatessen, we have appetizing, and we have luncheonette. But of course, back to our star. Oh, skipped one, the delicatessen. So the last thing I mentioned about the delicatessen was that a lot of people like to go and eat there before they went to, you know, see Yiddish theater. And a lot of these Jewish immigrants are saying, well, why stop at Yiddish theater? Why don't we go big? Why don't we go to Broadway and go to show business? And so these delicatessens that kind of start from these humble roots in the early 1900s from the Lower East Side, they start moving into the theater district. 
And that's when they started making these stuffed overstuffed sandwiches that we saw originally because they want to be part of the drama. They want to make it enticing and they start to attract non-Jews. Who do they want to bring in? They want to bring mobsters. They want to bring bourgeoisie. They want to bring the famous people, right? And that's when they start to become unkosher and start to become into mainstream culture. Um, so the stage delicatessen started making overstuffed sandwiches in 1937, and they would try to, you know, name them after celebrities and try to get more people in. But even though these were becoming unkosher and right kind of show businessy, they were all on these very much kosher roots, and these delicatessens came to represent the jazz age. So what could you find there? You could find a huge menu. You could find restaurants all over Central Park and Midtown. Um, Carnegie Deli was right next to Carnegie Hall. And for many ways, like, wow, what to say you didn't make it than being in, you know, Broadway and selling all these sandwiches from these humble, humble roots. And not only were Jews just involved in opening delicatessens in the Broadway, Jews in general became very involved in financing uh, Broadway shows, uh, acquiring real estate, creative talent, and this all became, you know, very quintessential New York City. So we have another very famous example. This is Ruben Delicatessen, right? And if any of you saw the sandwich, right, with the horseradish and the Russian dressing and the cheese, this is named after no other than a uh, German Jewish immigrant, Arnold Rubin. And he opened his deli in 1908 by the Lower East Side. By the 1920s, he no longer wants to be in the Lower East Side. He wants to be right by the Broadway. And he was, this was really a prominent diner from 1930 to 1960. So you see in this giant menu, we're no longer just, just selling meat here. What can you find at the Rubin's Delicatessen? You can find oysters. You can find foie gras, you can find steak, and you can find pork chops. But not only can you find pork chops, you can find matzo brai, right? Somebody mentioned matzo brai. Here you go. You had it at Rubens Delicatessen. But again, they also had, of course, pastrami and liver and gefilte fish. And right, these waitresses were often told to be snobby and rude as part of, you know, theater and the show business. Um, there was a famous, you know, jazz age delicatessen known as Lindy's. And the idea of Lindy's was adapted into the 1950s Broadway production of Guys and Dolls, uh, which there was a delicatessen by the name of Mindy. So at this point, already we see these delicatessens coming into mainstream culture, into Broadway shows. Um, and a lot of times right there, we're making fun of Jewish stereotypes. But at the same time, we also saw everybody at the Jewish delicatessen, right? And you didn't have to be Jewish. You could be anything you wanted. You no longer had to eat kosher food. And it was a place where everyone went to hang out. Um, and again, what could you find at one of these delicatessens? You could find neon signs, photos of the owner, soda signs, neon signs, oak chairs, antique things, and tarnished plates. Uh, so really Ruben, right to this day, the Ruben sandwich, I would say he was kind of a Jewish icon. He had really made it in America. He had popularized the sandwich, uh, right? He brought this pastrami roots with the Ottoman Turkish conquest and made it very bourgeoisie. Um, but again, even at this point, we see the like, contestant is not an easy business. There's not a lot of days off. A lot of families gave these businesses down and continued it through the generations. And there was not a few days off, very few days off, and a lot of these delicatessen start to be open on the high holidays. Right, in many ways, becoming like a new synagogue, the new secular traditional synagogue, but you can also have oysters there. So again, here are just some more photos. I mean, look at this one on the right. Like this lady is fancy. She's like in a black gown and she has pearls, but she's at the delicatessen. She's going to go eat a pastrami sandwich, but also something more. And then on the left, right, very classical style. And again, we see all men. Um, right in the 1930s, we still have over 1,500 delicatessens. And by this point, a lot of families um, and even after the Great Depression are really didn't, relying on going to the delicatessen to get a lot of their goods, Jewish, not Jewish, doesn't matter. 
okay, well, what about the Jewish woman? And here we have, of course, the fabulous Miss Maisel, who in many, many episodes could be seen, right, eating at the Jewish delicatessen. Well, there was kind of a fear, right, if, um, what would women do if they could just go and buy things at the delicatessen? Well, they would have a lot more freedom, right? They didn't have to stay at home and cook. They could go and play cards. They could go shopping, pursue finally their own freedoms, join the workplace, or of course, go and be part of a comedy club like Miss Maisel. Um, and this was actually a debate from the 1920s to the 1950s. Uh, the General Found Federation of Women's Club in 1925 actually proclaimed that there was a great fear that a woman who only shops at the delicatessen could be a grounds for a divorce and a marriage. Someone at that same conference joked that actually the secret to a great marriage was being next to the delicatessen. Um, so yeah, you kind of had both, right? You had some people who loved it, but right, as we see, especially from Romans, these start to have not just pastrami and not just, you know, cold cuts of meats, but a lot more sophisticated things that you could have. Okay. So by World War II, um, the delicatessen is definitely hit hard, right? You can, it's very difficult to eat an overstuffed sandwich when there are ratios and meat is being sent to soldiers. So I couldn't find too much about this, but right, if you go into Cat's Deli to this day, there's very much uh, this sign in the shirt that still exists that says, send a salami to your boy in the army. So they were trying to get entice people to come into Cat's Deli and buy a kosher salami and send it to someone uh, serving and fighting the Nazis, Jewish or non-Jewish. And on the right is actually a letter from 1944 of a Jewish man who I believe was in France. Um, and he wrote a letter to his fiance thanking her so much for sending him this salami from Katz Deli and how much it reminded him of the nostalgia and the Jewish delicatessen. And finally, he had some, some kosher food so, I, I mean, sadly, this is kind of the beginning to a, a decline in the Jewish delicatessen. We're definitely kind of getting out of the golden jazz age and uh, moving into something a, a little bit different. But yes, delicatessens were definitely hit by World War II. I'm, most businesses were. And there was a black market for this delicatessen meat, you know, this, I guess, so good meat that you just can't live without it. Okay, so by post-war, by the end of World War II, what's going on with, you know, Jews in America? What's going on with the delicatessen? So uh, Jews in America, they start moving. They start going out of New York City and they start moving across America. Um, if you're interested in this, you can read Deborah Dashmore, who uh, is a historian who kind of specializes right in, in Jew Jewish migration throughout the United States uh, in the 1950s. Um, right after the Holocaust, there's kind of this idea that Jews need to start um, making a name for themselves in America. They need to feel more established and they don't have to just be crowded in New York City. So on the right, we have a deli Katessin that opened in Miami on uh, Lincoln Road, which is a popular road there. And there were so many Jews who opened there, who moved there in the 1950s and 60s that they started to call it the shtetl out by the sea. Um, and again, they copied the style, took it with them, and brought it to Miami. On the left, we have Cantor's, which was brought to Los Angeles. A lot of Jews started to move there. Uh, additionally, something that's important to say about this period is a lot of Holocaust survivors who came to the United States once again found a community and a, a home in these Jewish delicatessens and even opened their own after being given like refuge and a job in these delicatessens. Um, so once again, it was always a place for Jews to gather and meet, not necessarily for uh, religious reasons, but also just the secular and, and you know, a connection. And at this point, we're really going to say that the delicatessen becomes more the deli. They get rid of the tessen. It's, I guess it's just too long. And um, some other notable places they bring to, not, of course, just Miami and L.A., but also up north to the Catskills, right in the Borscht Belt. There was a lot of resorts there uh, for upper state New York where, you know, catered specifically to Jews. So, of course, how could they go the summer without their Jewish deli food? So they bring it with them.
Okay. Um, so what is going on in New York City and kind of, I would say, the start of the downfall of the Jewish delicatessen and kind of back to where we are today. Um, so not just Jews are moving all throughout America, but Jews in New York City are moving to the suburbs. They're moving to New Jersey. They're moving to Westchester. Um, they're moving to Long Island, right? There's a lot of rising crime in New York City. Uh, but again, like Jews are starting to rise up in the ranks of American society. So they're not necessarily taking over their parents or great grandparents delicatessens anymore. They're becoming do doctors, lawyers, other corporate jobs. They're sending their kids to uh, college and right. A lot of these family businesses uh, start to die. Also, by the uh, post-war and 50s, 60s, you have the supermarket, you have frozen food. You have a lot of processed food. So why do you need the delicatessen if you can just go to the supermarket? Um, and of course, the delis, they they see this. So what do they do? They try to start branding to people who are not Jewish, uh, which gets these campaigns, right? You don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's real right. And you see all kinds of different ethnicities. Um, and at this point, there's really a rise of, you know, more secular Judaism and um, a lot more kosher style and right, a lot less like kosher, kosher delicatessens are opening, rather kosher style and right cheese is put on a lot of these deli sandwiches. Other, you know, basic reasons for why there's a decline, real estate becomes more expensive, um, McDonald's, stuff like that. There's a lot more fast food. And this also happens to a lot of our appetizing places that we saw. And, you know, this is, there's a lot of tough competition. One specific tough competition, Chinese food. So there's, this is the greatest rival of the Jewish delicatessen. Jews are also flocking here on a Sunday night. Uh, right, there's always been kind of this connection of Jews and, and Chinese people, right, that the Chinese also are marginalized, and they're also open on the Christian holidays. Um, they actually said, you know, it was safe treif, treif meaning unkosher in Yiddish, so going to eat Chinese food was safe treif. Uh, well, you know, Chinese food is definitely easy to eat because, right, there's not a lot of dairy, and things that are unkosher are not necessarily seen. And it became so popular in the 60s that a lot of delis, they tried to make their own fusion of Chinese food, Chinese Jewish food. And there were some crazy combos. There was lo mein with chicken liver. There was pastrami fried rice, gefilte fish instead of shrimp puffs. And if you, you know, ventured down and went to a non-kosher place, like that was even more fun because, right, it was even more of a taboo. Uh, right, you see some really fun things on this menu, egg foo young with chicken liver, right, Romanian pastrami fried rice. Um, and yeah, I love, those are some great prices back then. Okay. And that really brings us to the 1970s. Uh, by this point, there is not a lot of Jews living in the Lower East Side. A lot of new waves of immigrants are coming. There's a lot of gentrification all over New York City. Uh, more and more Jews are moving to the suburbs. And uh, some of the things that are kind of going on in the 70s, right, there's kind of this hippie free love era, but also this, you know, this food pyramid kind of comes to be that we should eat healthier. We should not eat so much processed food that we've been eating for the last 20 years and um, right, maybe eat things with less cholesterol. So the Jewish deli sandwich doesn't have much of a, a good, you know, good say for that. Um, there's also this guy on the left who is uh, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, who was kind of uh, famous for renewal Ju Judaism in the 1970s. He kind of advocates, right, uh, for Jews to be much more egalitarian, to be more sustainable, and he does not necessarily say that, you know, Jews need to definitely does not care if Jews are eating kosher or not, but kind of right taking those hippie things. Uh, but even while this is going on, um, there's still very much humor and love of the Jew Jewish deli and the Jewish tradition. Um, right. Jews are still using humor to help face discrimination in America, and they're making fun of themselves through Jewish delicatessen. It was very 
popular 70s, 80s to find, you know, skits on SNL, right? Where you, uh, something like a sketch where a Jewish man would bring a non-Jewish woman to the deli. Uh, there was still a lot of like humor commercialism in the masculinity of the deli. Uh, but another thing that's going on by the 1980s, right? More and more Jews are not kosher. So a lot of people who are kosher are trying to branch out into new cuisines and right sushi becomes a thing. Everyone wants to go eat sushi by the 1980s. Uh, and in some ways, I would say, you know, assimilation has run its course for a lot of Jews of New York by this time. And they're moving on to new foods and new things. Uh, but I do want to watch quickly a clip of Larry David, who, of course, is kind of this humor that I'm talking about of Larry David who's very much an assimilated Jew, but he tries to pretend that he's still Jewish. And where does he do that? Um, of course, he goes to this Jewish deli. So let's watch. It's a two minute clip. Uh, Mr. Heineman, how are you, sir? It's what a great, great pleasure to meet you. Oh, it's nice to meet you. Does have enough? Sit down, please. Thank you. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little, a late, uh, you know, ah, the column. It's not a big problem. Uh, yeah. What's my Ah, What a mitzvah it was for you to leave that note on my car. Well, how could I do anything less than that? I'd have to be a sociopath to hit somebody's car and then and then go away into the night as if nothing happened. Thank you. Thank you. What happened? I was listening to Jewish radio, and, and they were talking about Israel, and I got so worked up, I lost control of my car. May I offer you some lunch? Please. Morning. Menus, please. It's kosher. You know that. Oh. See, so wake up. Hello? No, 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 no. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that invitation, but I cannot go to the baseball game on the Sabbath. I'm sorry. It's impossible. I'll take a rain check, however. Oh, okay. I'd love to go to the game, but not on the Sabbath. The Yankees are playing, and I would I would kill to go down there. You're a Yankee fan? Oh, I was a Yankee fan. I'm a huge Yankee fan. I love the Yankees. You love the Yankees? There are so many times when the Yankees were playing in Anaheim that I have so much wanted to go to see it. I, I, I even cheat by watching it on television. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> 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 There are two things in my life that I love, besides family and my work. I love baseball, love baseball, especially because I love to ski. Uh, I, 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 my yarmulke almost fell off. I'm so taken aback. <laughs> what? Skiing? You said skiing. Yeah, well, I'm not good, but I, I I'm not so good myself, but I love it. You love it? Oh, it's my favorite thing to do in life. Ach, <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful coincidence? I have a, a little ski lodge. Really? Yes. I would love to invite you to go skiing. Right. So, as you can see there, Larry, he, uh, this is from over 15 years ago, uh, right? We're really at a, in our, especially in our timeline, we're really at a decline of the Jewish delicatessen, but Larry David is still very much making jokes and making fun of like Jewish stereotypes and right, he pretending to speak Yiddish and pretending, right, laughing at the fact that Jews are not good athletes. Um, he's still doing it where at the Jewish delicatessen. So it is still very much in mainstream culture and right, still a place where are associated with Jews and help them kind of feel at home and, and uh, assimilate by, by laughing at themselves at the Jewish deli. And, and again, it's funny because they're in a deli in L.A., but of course they're talking about the Yankees who play in New York City. So still kind of, he's blending everything all together. So that kind of brings us very much to today, which I called Jewish and nostalgia. So nostalgia pays. So we have a lot of new things, right, going on. Um... By the late 1990s, right, there were only 15 kosher delis left in New York City. Today, there's only around 20 or so that we can consider historic delis. But really, this is the question. What is exactly a deli anymore? What is makes something a Jewish delicatessen? What makes something American? 
Uh, you'll find all sorts of things in these new delicatessens. You'll find fusion. You'll find sustainability. You'll find places that are hipster. And right, you will find bagel and locks right next to your meat. It's all of a catch-all. And a lot more assimilation going on and a lot more blending. And right as we saw that first video, cats, they they do not, right? They don't, they're not kosher. So they're not advertising to kosher Jews. Uh, they're trying to bring more and more tourists in. They're trying to bring this iconic New York City nostalgia rather than bringing other Jewish people in. Um, but some places are reopening. So we have Second Avenue Deli, which is a kosher place. They reopened in 2011 from the nephews uh, who are a new generation who want to honor the culture of those who came to America with nothing. Uh, so they're kind of bringing back this nostalgia. Um, but again, like you'll find also vegan options now. You'll find chicken. You'll find sandwiches that are not overstuffed in three different sizes. Because as you can see, this is even an outdated graph. But the deli sandwich is definitely over $20. And really, we see that these places are still existing because nostalgia is powerful. And there are people who still want like the secular place with a Jewish connection and to, you know, eat something that their great grandparents made have had in a place that they can go on the weekend. Um, some other places that have reopened, we have Shelsky's, which reopened in Cobble Hill as an appetizing specifically in 2012. And then we have a place in Brooklyn called Frankel's from Brothers Zach and Alex Frankel who grew up on the Upper West Side, and they opened Frickles, Delicatessen, and Appetizing. So they have both and both. So they took the traditions and mixed them together in their new, I guess, non-kosher fusion. Um, some other places, we have Black Seed Bagels, which opened in 2014. And the place in the middle, right? We've been talking about how delis have always been such masculine places. We have a place completely pink. Um, this place is called Call Your Mother. It did not open in New York City. It opened in D.C. And then it came to Denver. And I went to the one in Denver. And um, it definitely does not feel like a delicatessen. It feels like you're at the club. There's like loud clubbing music and uh, pastrami sandwiches on a bagel. So right, they really got rid of anything masculine, made this a super place pink. And they opened their first one in 2018. A lot of these places are also opening, you know, to bring more healthy food um, and to give Ashkenazi food a better rap, right? Because a lot of people say Ashkenazi food is terrible. Um, but, right, there's been a lot of industrialization of Ashkenazi food. You think of Manischewitz and Lipton, right? We need, like, good, high-quality food. Um, some other places we have. This is Milan Deli which is also in Brooklyn, Delicatessen. And this place is kind of interesting because they are people, sorry, they're from a family that originally immigrated to Montreal and then they came to Brooklyn. So they kind of have a fusion. They have like poutine, which is fries with like a cheese and gravy sauce from Canada. But you could also, again, find your classic sandwich. And then we have on the bottom there, we have a food cart from Columbus, Ohio. So again, there's like fusions of everything. And Ted Merwin, he called this uh, new grittiness or novio grittiness in French. I said it awfully. Uh, right, he, they, we want a lot of these places to feed our nostalgia. We want, um, we want these like clean places that remind us of the delicatessen without maybe that grittiness of the delicatessen. And there are so many, you know, historic places that still exist. We still have uh, cats, of course, Ross and Daughters is still there. Sarge's is still there. Um, this place on the up on the left, Essen New York Deli, that is uh, in Midwood, uh, Brooklyn, and that one is specifically a kosher place. Um, some things you can find there is not just delicatessen food, but you can also find things like cholent, um, which is right a, a hearty meat stew eaten on the Shabbat, and they you know they open other palace. They have things like spaghetti meatballs and steak. So these places are still existing, but they're, you know, combining, they're fusing, they're they're becoming something, something new. And again, they are also basking in the fact that you do not have to be Jewish to love any of it. You don't even have to be American. You can especially be a tourist. Um, but their roots are still there and the traditions are still there. So yeah, just some more historic uh, exhibits. And I'm obviously not the only one interested in this because last year, um, 
the Jewish Deli exhibition was opened and premiered in Los Angeles and then came to New York City at the New York Historical Society. Very much bringing up all these nostalgic feelings of over, you know, over 100 years ago where it all started. And then I have one last video. So many chances is a is a throwback. It's a snapshot in time. It's being connected to your parents, to your grandparents, to your great grandparents, to your great great grandparents, because they all came here. We do not believe in changing pretty much anything from the walls uh, to the neons to the pictures to the staff to the food to the recipes. We don't really believe in changing it. You come here because you want that nostalgia and that tradition and that food that you know and love. Jewish deli food dates back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So yeah, he, the guy, or sorry, this uh, owner now, Josh Dell, he said it best, right? You want, they don't change anything at all. You want that nostalgia. And right, he's continuing the heritage of the original Katz family. Um, at 